Golden State Warriors are heading back to the finals. It's their sixth finals in eight seasons. It's the first time a team has put up those types of finals appearance numbers since the 90s Bulls. Um, and it's just, it's a testament to the strength of the team. This is a team that looked like they were, you know, completely done uh, just last year, two years ago, after the injuries to Clay, some injuries to Steph. Um, the, the thing that I keep thinking about when it comes to the Warriors is I picture that game six in Golden State in the finals against the Raptors where Steph just like he's just sitting on the court and he's got like his head down and he just looks so like tired defeated bummed and that's after Clay goes out um KD's out at that point like it was just one thing after another with them and to see them back at this point I think it's a testament to uh the drafting um obviously Players like Jordan Poole uh, have made a huge impact. Uh, Andrew Wiggins and acquiring him and being able to um, kind of just give him basketball rehab, get him into an all-star starter, um, a true two-way threat, and really Clay Thompson coming back. Like I, I remember Steph saying, you know, everyone's writing us off right now, but think about it, like be ready next year when Clay comes back. And he said that in 2020, 2021, and now here we are. Um, before going to that, um, though, I want to talk a little bit about Dallas. Uh, it was a great season. Um, this isn't the ending you want, obviously. Like, they kind of looked a little bit like they knew, like, they looked like losing was inevitable for the first half, at least. Like, it looked like they were going through the motions. Luca was hoisting threes rather than, you know, trying to drive in. Um, Dallas did outshoot, um, Golden State at the line. Um, they also hit more, more threes. They were like 17 of 46 from three. Um, but no one else stepped up. Luca had a poor shooting night. He had 28 points on 28 shots. Uh, the only other player close to him in scoring was Spencer Dinwiddie, who had 26. But they didn't get any contributions from pretty much anyone else. Dorian Finney-Smith chipped in 13, and like that's a good contribution for him. But like... 10 from Jalen Brunson, 3 from Maxi Kleber, 2 from Davis Bertans. Uh, it just, it's not going to cut it. Dwight Powell played 7 minutes, had 2 points. Like, not good. And I know it probably wouldn't have swung the series. Um, I think it might have made it closer when you think about how his skill set fits in with the team. But it's important to remember that Dallas did not have Tim Hardaway Jr. for this series and for the entire playoffs. He was ruled out indefinitely with a foot injury. Uh, he had surgery on his foot on, I want to say, like the fourth or fifth metatarsal back in February. And that was it. <laughs> he has not been seen since. And foot stuff is scary. But he was an important part of that team before going out. Like the, the Mavericks whole thing is, is Luka and Dinwiddie and Brunson can put pressure on the defense, collapse the defense, kick it out to open shooters. And Tim Hardaway Jr. is an open, you know, catch-and-shoot type of player. So not having him, not having an extra shooting threat, um, he is a driving threat as well. He can definitely, you know, create a little bit with the ball in his hands. Um, and he's a good mover with off-ball. He really knows where to be. He's a smart player. He's a good cutter. Like I said, I don't think it would, you know, completely swing the series. But... It's important to remember that they didn't have one of their key offensive pieces. But overall, this is this is a strong, successful season for them. I know it's probably disappointing to have as many good Luka performances as they had this year and to come up short of the finals, but you trade Porzingis halfway through the year. You change from, you know, a superstar and a second star into a superstar and just a well-constructed team, and... I gotta say, I think they overachieved. I think they they definitely um, surprised a lot of teams that did not see this coming, uh, that did not see this type of deep run coming. Just ask Phoenix. Um, so when it comes to retooling, I think they'll probably be um, pretty aggressive in the offseason, but I don't know what that's going to come at the, the price of. So like maybe they don't keep Brunson and Dinwiddie. Maybe they try to move off of Tim Hardaway now. Uh, Rudy Gobert is a name that's been really tied to them, and I think that makes a lot of sense, um, especially because Luka needs that pick-and-roll lob threat. Uh, he's obviously one of the top passers in the game, 
and to give him not only the roll option, but also the rim protection on the back end in someone like Gobert um, could really be helpful. I thought DeAndre Ayton too, but I don't think there's any way Phoenix trades him <laughs> there. And I also think that everything, uh, Charlotte's gonna, the Charlotte Hornets are going to do everything they can to go get DeAndre Ayton. I have no reason to believe that. I just think that if I was running a team like Charlotte and I had a player like LaMelo Ball, DeAndre Ayton is the number one player I would want to go get for him. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see what happens with that. Um, I do think Dallas will be aggressive. I think, you know, the development of Luka is going to be another important thing because as this series went on and as these games got tougher, he looked gassed. He looked really tired. And part of that is probably conditioning. Probably part of that, too, is how much he's asked to do. So you can't really, like, get on him completely about his conditioning because, yeah, he showed up to, like, training camp and the start of the season. He was, you know, out of shape and overweight. But, like, he's played an entire season and a deep postseason run. So I'm not too concerned about his conditioning now. I think it's more an indication that he was just doing so much that he was just gassed out, which means, you know, you have to really take a look at at Dinwiddie and Brunson and think, are these your two best backup guard options? Like, are these the two dudes that best provide that, that you know, scoring option, the playmaking option when Luke is on the bench? Can we maximize the time he's on the bench with these two guards as our ball handlers? And I think the answer is, like, somewhere between sure and yes. Like, you don't feel 100% good about it, but it's, you know, it's not the worst depth chart in the league. Um, I have no idea what they could do to upgrade there. I think signing Brunson should probably be a priority, um, if not trying to use him in a signing trade somewhere. But it's going to be interesting to see. Uh, but at the same time, this was a great season for Dallas. I don't think they should be, you know, like d disappointed, yes, of course, but like this wasn't a failure of a season. Uh, as long as they learn from it and continue to improve, um, I do also have to say, as much as it pains me, um, hats off to Jason Kidd on the coaching job this season. I am not a Jason Kidd fan. Did not think it was going to go well after his previous coaching stints. And uh, he really maximized this team. Uh, I can't really think of anything else to say as far as that. Um, so we'll see what Dallas does. I think it's going to be interesting to watch them. They're one of those teams that I think has the highest variance for like they could make a huge leap in the offseason or they can, you know, kind of regress to the mean as these other Western Conference teams make moves and get healthier. So we'll see. Uh, on the flip side, though, like I said, Golden State, six finals in eight years is unreal. That's six finals appearances in nine seasons for Klay Thompson, which also an incredible feat. Um, and the best part about this was game six, Klay came a game early he hit eight threes 32 points he looked like clay thompson he was doing a very good job of you know stopping the ball handlers on defense he looked a little bit more like himself and now with a week between the finals uh or between this and the final starting uh should be a really good opportunity for all of the warriors to get healthy there's no updates yet on um andre Iguodala and gary payton the second but we'll see with the whole week off you know those guys are probably going to be more likely to play than not. Um, I had forgotten all about the conference MVP awards. And I got to be honest, I was really surprised. So Steph Curry wins the inaugural Magic Johnson Western Conference Finals MVP trophy, uh, which averaged like 28 points, 7 rebounds, and 8 assists a game this, play this Western Conference Finals. So I get it. But I really, really think that Andrew Wiggins and Kevon Looney had good cases and good arguments. I mean, maybe it came down to they didn't want one of those guys to be the first. But Andrew Wiggins, what he did this this series was absolutely incredible. He lifted them at a time it seemed like, you know, they were kind of running out of gas and going through the motions. And if they end up winning the finals, if they make it back to the finals and win the NBA championship, he is going to be a large reason why. And that's an incredible sentence to say. And it's a testament to, to him being committed to rehabbing his image and to, you know, trying to revive his career after being considered a bust in Minnesota. And it's a testament to the Warriors, that team, that culture, and that staff. So 
nothing but respect to to everyone involved for that. And then Kevon Looney shifted the whole Western Conference final series. When Draymond got kicked out, um, not kicked out, he got into foul trouble, had the, the five fouls early, uh, the technical foul early, and was just on the bench for most of the second uh, half run that they went on. In game two, I want to say, Kevon Looney completely changed that team's complexion. He was grabbing rebounds like crazy, and he gave them a completely different identity that they could use. And that that energy, that nonstop hustle, really lifted uh, everyone else, it seems. So I am kind of surprised that they wouldn't um, wouldn't give him some of that that consideration. But who knows? Um, I don't think it's like a voting thing where like we'll see how it went. Um, but the Warriors heading back to the finals, they will play either the Celtics, who can clinch tonight um, in Boston in Game Six, or the Miami Heat if they engineer an improbable comeback. Uh, Draymond Green has already said that he thinks it'll probably be Boston. I'm sure Miami loves to hear that. I'm sure Boston loves to hear that. Um, we'll see, though. I think both teams kind of have interesting, um, interesting style matchups against the Warriors. Uh, if the if the Celtics do close it out, you know, good for both teams. Give them time to rest up and get healthy. Uh, the Warriors are for sure gonna enjoy that week off. Um, this, I guess, was the more entertaining of the conference finals. Just because it wasn't always a blowout, like there were some come from behind and like some moments it got close and and stuff like that, but like overall, it kind of just felt inevitable. After the Warriors came back in Game Three and pulled away and took that, it was like, oh okay, we we all see what's gonna happen here. Let's just uh, let's get through it. But who knows? Uh, the Warriors are back in the finals, and they always seem to. Put in their best efforts in the finals, so I'm sure whoever they play, it's going to be a good series. Uh, please let me know in the comments your predictions for their finals matchup or who you would like to see them play, um, just preferentially. Please let me know in the comments your thoughts. I would really enjoy hearing from you. Uh, thank you very much for watching. Enjoy the game tonight, and I'll talk to you soon.